just waiting for people to start arriving. Um, um, while we wait for people to come in, I'd just like to say welcome everybody. Um, please, uh, you, I mean, I'm sure we've got a couple of regulars that know the drill already, but uh, please introduce yourselves and the organizations that you're from. Please switch uh, the chat box to address panel and panelists and attendees if it's not already there so that everybody can see um, who you are and what you're saying. And um, yeah, let's get right into it. My name is Sungula Kabinde. I am the managing community manager at CHRO South Africa. And today we're going to be exploring ways to use data to deliver a personalized employee experience at scale. Now, creating a unique employee experience at scale might sound daunting, but it's all about understanding where your employees come from and how you can improve your experience using various touch points. That's how you'll ultimately be able to create something bespoke for every single employee. It's very much like uh, social media, which is 100% personalized. You get personal co content uh, based on the things that you like and the people you associate with, and that helps people feel more in control and helps, helps them deal with the information overload. Companies who do this well, will invariably enjoy better returns in terms of customer satisfaction. And today we'll be discussing why the same approach should be taken with your internal customers, your employees. On the panel, we have Feralyn Spies, Group Employee Benefits and Funds Manager at MassMart, uh, Gareth van Rensburg, who's the MD of GoFetch, as well as Sally Acton, the MD of Employee Experience Consultancy Talk. Welcome to you all and thank you so much for you know, uh, spending time with us today. Uh, now, I think I, we have Sally who's going to kind of set the tone for, for the discussion and kind of give us the lay of the land when it comes to creating uh, personalized employee experiences at scale. After Sally's pre uh, presentation, we'll get into a bit of a panel discussion. Thereafter, we'll do a bit of a Q&A. So as you're listening to Sally's presentation and uh, the comments from uh, the other panelists, Drop your comments in the chat so that we collate them and uh, revisit them at the Q&A section. Uh, Sally, um, it's over to you. We'll go off camera for now and uh, come back after you're done. Thanks so much, Angela. Um, good morning, everybody, and welcome, and thanks so much for joining us this morning. I'm really looking forward to taking you through this, this topic. Um, we are hoping to have a really great Q&A session with you a little bit later, so uh, please send through all of your comments and questions, and we'll get to them at the end. We also have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you during our uh, discussion, so please um, keep an eye out on the polls. So having a look at personalizing your employee experience at scale, um, it's, it sounds like quite a daunting task, especially when we're, we're looking at large organizations with lots of employees, but it's really not that bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through, I think the, the why, like, first of all, why do we want to do this? How does it benefit your employee experience? And what is going to be the, the result for your employees? Then how, where do we get the data from? What do we do with it? Uh, and then eventually, what does that look like? So what, what can you do once you have these different data points? And then I'm going to, uh, to ask the panelists to join me again. So let's jump straight into it. And I'm going to, uh, let me just move this a little bit out of the way. So I'm going to, to jump in and ask you, first of all, do you believe that uh, having a personalized employee experience does improve employee-ness, happy, employee happiness? What do you think? Yes, no, are you unsure? You've never tested, let me know. Let's have a look. Oh, she's we're looking good here. Every hundred percent, fantastic. <laughs> I, I must be honest, I believe that it does. So I think that we're all in agreement. And if we agree, then uh, I think we're off to a good start. So let's, um, let's carry on with it now. So uh, HBR did a, did a survey last year and we, um, we had a look at that result. 
And 56% of the respondents reported that their employer should understand them as well as they are expected to understand their customers. But only 39% of the, rep the respondents in the study felt that their workplace was fulfilling this expectation. Um, and, you know, if we have a look at the employee experience and we look at hyper-personalization, um, as they say, you know, the, I didn't choose the hyper-personalized life, the hyper-personalized life chose me. And a huge chunk of our workforce now are what we, we would consider to be digitally native. So they're used to hyper-personalization. They're used to it when they, as Sungula said, when they engage with social media, they're used to it when they receive their grocery vouchers or when they receive their, uh, their health care. So they, they feel seen and they feel valued when they are receiving hyper-personalized offerings from their business. Um, so, I mean, it's really called, they call it the Amazon effect, which is uh, after the tech company and the, not the same as the greenhouse effect, but the Amazon effect has brought these, these expectations into mainstream. And it's funny enough, hyper-personalization allows for autonomy. The more, uh, the more somebody feels that you know them, the more empowered that they feel. And it seems kind of weird but in a way, employees are consumers of the workplace and the best talent know that they are the best talent and that they can make demands, uh, especially in terms of tailor-made rewards and benefits. This is really where we see um, the expectations coming where uh, they, they're starting to have a look at the demands. Um, a pro, you know, a pro tip from our side obviously is looking at that um, hyper-personalization when you look at your rewards and benefits program is really uh, and integrating that into your EVP is really where you can start to have a great employee experience. For example, if you have a huge range of, of benefits on offer that caters to a broad demographic, um, you can give people the autonomy on how to spend their money. So if you have a look at uh, making suggestions that are leading them down a path of, of different options that are available and based on the data points that you receive from them, they're actually able to choose the benefit package that's going to be working the best uh, for them. They feel that they've had control over how to spend their money and that they've chosen um, a benefits package that really works for them. So that's one way that, um, that we really see that kind of data-driven HR um, taking taking the lead. Also, top-down programs and innovation initiatives fall flat um, if they are if they're overlooking the perceived employee reality. So, in order to make these work, we really need to personalize them. And what I mean by that is, if you have a look at where an employee is and what they are uh, what they are needing to do in their job. It needs to be tailor made in terms of the programs that you're positioning for them. So learning and development programs, onboarding experiences and innovation programs really need to have a look at what the employee actually needs. Um, this allows the employee to have better decision making and the quicker they can make decisions, uh, the more value it adds to your business. After all, um, if an employee is going through a seamlessly intuitive experience, it allows them to be able to focus more on the job at hand. And that obviously is, you know, what we would like them to be doing. <laughs> so if we have a look at, um, if we have a look at what, what is technically known as the employee-employer alignment model, um, employees need baseline fair rewards at the bottom of the tri at the bottom of the pyramid, a positive atmosphere, freedom and choices, and the opportunities to excel and fulfill their higher purpose or their self-esteem and internal needs. So how these needs are prioritized are obviously going to vary between person, it's going to change over time. And employers who understand this um, will be able to create an authentic human experience for everybody that works at the business. So the way that you do this, obviously, is by, le by leveraging the technology that you have to give insight onto every single employee and to see what they need and at what stage that they are. Let's have a quick look at that in terms of, uh, in terms of the actual model. So before 
this used to be known as kind of the intangible or soft side of the business employee experience and looking at these different needs. But now 80% of the top 500 companies now work out their values based on this. So I'm not, uh, I'm not sold on this being a, a soft or intangible side of business anymore. After all, all of the ideas and innovations that come out of businesses are people driven. And this is where we really start to see value. So if we can start to create those authentic experiences for the employees at scale, we're tapping into a massive amount of innovation. We're looking at ideas that are coming from a hugely diverse employee base. And this is really where companies can start to drive value. Even the most basic data that you hold on someone can give you an indication of their environmental needs. And we can start to have a look at who our employees are, what they need, um, based on a, a very, very few data points as a beginning point. And then we can start to flesh them out and really start to develop what we would call an employee persona. And I think if we're looking at the main thing to remember in the why stage, um, it's I mean, if, we, if we're all honest with each other, and you'll have to excuse me because ESCOM decided this morning that I shouldn't have power um, and I shouldn't have coffee. So this uh, example that I'd written in really is, is cutting me deep this morning, but it is nice to pick a coffee off the menu. But when you walk in and the barista already knows how you take your coffee without asking, that difference is key. And that is ultimately what we are looking to create for our employees when they come into our business. We're looking at knowing exactly what they need, how they take their coffee, what they want. And that's what we're ultimately looking to create with our data points um, and create that amazing experience for them. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants to send me a coffee, um, that would be amazing too. And I would be deeply appreciative. So Let's get into the how. Now, this is really where, um, where I, I enjoy uh, playing. So let's have a look. First of all, in how are we going to start to create this, this personalized, let's call it the personalized coffee experience. So how are we going to create that? The first step is to having a look at where does the data come from? So data in the HR space and data-driven HR comes from a couple of different places. The first is obviously payroll. Payroll data is going to be um, probably one of your main sources of employee data, as well as your recruitment data. So as somebody is onboarded and as you're going through the recruitment phase, this, what, what I would call your golden time. So that's between um, when you've made the offer of employment and an employee actually starts at your business. This is when your offer of exchange is the strongest and you're able to collect a lot of key data for around your employee at this point. Um, there's obviously also training data. So how is somebody um, engaging with the training material? What have they passed? What have they not passed? What are they interested in? Uh, you're able to collect that data there. Staff satisfaction, um, absenteeism reports, productivity reports, and then personal development and KPIs. So the reason why I bring in absenteeism and productivity reports is when we when we get into the, the sort of the next level of um, data-driven HR, and we can start to look into predictive analytics, but we'll get there at the end. And step two then, now we've got all of this data, and I know that Garrett's going to speak to it a little bit later, but we need to start looking at how we overlay that data and how we create a single employee view and segment out um, the employees and staff. This is the basic work of your personas. So we need to start looking at your segmentation. So what is your employee's role in the business? Where are they located? Um, what is their level of seniority? What is their language preference? Um, which brand or business unit do they belong to? And then what channels are available to that employee for communication, as well as the length of tenure? How long have they been with you? Um, where have they been? What has their employee journey looked like so far? And then their benefits layer. What benefits have they selected? What benefits do they have access to? And again, this is something that's going to be changing, so needs to be kept updated. Once we've got all of that, we need to overlay that with our user-led data. So that is our employee data that they're actually giving us. So that's your, your surveys or pulse inputs. So how are they feeling about certain things? Um, 
potentially this has uh, this has content implications. Um, how is somebody dealing with with mental health? How um, how fit are they in terms of getting a challenge? Um, how happy are they? Uh, where would they like to go in terms of their um, their trajectory in the business? And then using your managerial input as well. What has your uh, your manager layer been able to uh, garner about that employee? What do they want from their jobs and what are their motivational drivers? That information can be captured during the, the KPIs or potentially during one-on-ones. And this information can be used with great effect to inform your recognition and rewards. When we were talking about that a little bit earlier around your EVP and this being something that your top talent looks at, this is a great place to collect that data and use that to inform the rewards and recognition, not just for your rewards and recognition programs, but rewards and recognition that is tailor-made to those specific individuals. For example, if somebody has a huge lean towards something that benefits their family, you want to have a look at rewards and recognitions that speak to um, potentially bounce, uh, things to take their kids to, to bounce. If that person doesn't have a family, potentially we're looking at something else in terms of reward and recognition. And then their content interaction, where do they need help? So how are they engaging with different pieces of content and where are they engaging with those different pieces of content? This is going to show you your channels that are going to be most effective for those specific employees and uh, what content you should be delivering to them on those channels. So developing a persona for your employees uh, is really the culmination of all of those three steps. And you can start to do potentially work with your marketing department and actually look at creating your, your, um, your business employees for your, your business employees, your business personas for your employees. It does take time, but don't give up. Um, it does also keep changing, but it is worth doing. Uh, can I ask, yeah, thank you, Sangula. Can I ask how many of you have actually developed an employee persona set in your business? Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so mostly most most people haven't developed um, a persona set yet. It is definitely something that I recommend doing, even if you start out with some very base level personas and work out who those people are in your business, what are their drivers, what do they want. Um, your marketing department will have had a lot of uh, experience with developing your customer personas and potentially you can employ them to help you start to develop a, an employee persona. This is a really, really, really great and easy way to start um, creating content that speaks to those different personas. These personas, as I say, are refined over time and you're able to, uh, to, keep, to keep adding to that um, to that persona model and expanding out because if you started with five, I can guarantee you in a few uh, in a few years you'll probably be at about fifteen. But it is a really great way to start to create tailor made content to start to look at your rewards and recognitions that actually speak to those different um, employee personas. So thanks very much for for giving me your input there. So things to remember in the how stage. Um, you need to be transparent and compliant about where the data comes from so uh, and how you intend to use it from the get-go. So this doesn't just speak to, to Poppy, which I know is on everybody's mind, but I think when you are collecting data from your employees, you do need to tell them um, we are going to be utilizing this data to also inform your rewards and recognition program. We're going to be using it to inform the uh, the way that you receive your content, the channel that you receive your content. This is really, really important. It builds trust and it, um, and it shows your employees exactly what's going to be happening with that data. A good data output means getting good data input. 
So you need to stress the, the importance of this at your input points. So when collecting data um, from your different HR divisions or at um, the onboarding phase, or when you're looking at uh, health and wellness or let's say wellness days, you need to stress the importance of good, good data in, good data out. That's going to really inform how good this employee experience is. And this is a very challenging part of the um, creating the personalized employee experience. I know that we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, and then selecting the right, the right data for your needs. Um, and recognizing that working with data to achieve a personalized employee experience requires both time and skill. Uh, if you need assistance in this space, I do recommend that you lean on your BI, your BI people, your business intelligence, or have a chat with IT and see how, um, how your data can be utilized effectively. It isn't a skill that traditionally sits in the HR space, but it's definitely going to be something that is going to become more of a need. And developing an interest and understanding how data works is going to be something that, um, that from a future employee experience perspective is going to become more and more important. So it is something that I would recommend that you start um, familiarizing yourself with if you're not into data at the moment. And then, so then bring in the best people for the jobs. They may be closer to the frontline or in IT. So your frontline people, maybe your store managers, they may be able to give you better insight onto what data is available and the collection uh, methods that would best work to, to actually get that data from your employees. It might be using something like a bot. It might be using something like your, uh, your KPI data. It might be something like checking in or applying for leave. These might be great data collection points that are not currently being utilized. And I'd love to know, and please pop in um, into the questions, uh, if you have any queries around what are going to be great data points for collection, and we can certainly get into that and have a look at how that works for your specific business. Um, so ultimately, what does this look like for your employees? So now we've got all this data, we've overlaid it. What does this look like for them? So for your employees, this looks like a personalized onboarding all the way through. So from the moment that they join the company, they're going to be seeing information that is pertinent to the brand that they're going to be joining, the location that they're going to be going to. So you're showing them a welcome message from their relevant department head because we know who they're going to be working with. We're showing them what their specific building that they're going to be going to looks like. Uh, where do they find the bathroom? What's for lunch on the first day at the canteen? This is where that first impression and that personalized onboarding really, really, really takes um, takes the next level in terms of employee experience. We're going to be able to provide them with targeted services or platforms. So if we know which medical aid scheme they're using, or if we know which benefit package they're on, or we know what they need to learn, um, we're able to direct them to the correct place and only publish information to them that is of relevance to them to be able to do their job. So if they, for example, um, would have access to reporting problems for maintenance, they would need to be able to see that platform or perhaps they need to be able to have access to booking visits for people that are coming for meetings. That information is not necessarily relevant to someone that perhaps is working in, um, in frontline, but is very pertinent to people that are working at head office. So that is where we want to only show them what they need. Uh, that streamlines exactly what they need to be able to do every day and it allows, um, it allows them to get on and do their job rather than having to sift through lots of different pieces of information to find what they need. The same when you're providing them with documents on your intranet or on your employee experience portal, you want to be able to show them only the things that they need for their job that is relevant to them in the language that they speak. So somebody who works in Mozambique and works, uh, for example, in like a in Boulder's warehouse would see something completely different to somebody that works in South Africa and works in game. The language would be different. The information that they would need to see would be completely different. Training and development paths is another place where we see employee, um, employee experience taking a huge front, uh, front seat. 
and showing people only the training and development information that they need in order to truly develop their own um, their own careers. Career guidance as well, access to mentorship programs. Um, this might be, for example, only available at certain levels. We want to make sure that only those levels see those access pieces or see those content pieces, <coughs> excuse me, um, as they, we, we don't want the rest of the employee base to feel that they are not having access to everything. So here's when you need to look at those data pieces again and make sure it's only, um, only being targeted to those specific data points. Health and wellness, we've spoken a little bit about and benefits. If somebody is uh, perhaps struggling with, um, with diabetes, we want to be able to make sure that they are seeing access to information that will support them through that, um, through dealing with that illness. And we want to make sure that they're seeing that content, but it's not relevant to somebody else. So they shouldn't be able to see that benefits as well. You want to be able to show updates to provident funds, to different changes in medical aid, but only to the actual package that is applicable to that employee. Employee assistance programs, again, we want to be able to show them um, what their specific job function has access to so that people are able to be ch uh, channeled to the correct service. This will allow for efficiency within the organization and will also be able to um, get the employee the help that they need as fast as possible. And then, of course, the tools to do their jobs. Some people need to have access to specific pieces of training. They need to have access to specific pieces of call logging. And this can all be done uh, by targeting based on those data points that we've spoken about already. So things to remember about what we are after is digital is a large part of creating this, um, this employee experience. And obviously the digital data points is something that we focus very strongly on, but it is not the only way to collect this data or to make a personalized experience. So do not forget about all the channels that you have available to you. You can utilize things like USSD. You can utilize polls that are uh, done paper-based and can be dropped off in boxes. You can use SMS shortcode. These are other ways that you can collect the data that you need in order to A, work out which channel people like to be engaged on. I mean, and this is, this is quite key what they have uh, access to. And of course, asking things like polls and surveys can be then deployed through multiple channels and you're not then reliant on having a kiosk, having a, um, having, a, having a computer, having a specific email address. You can utilize a lot of different channels to get the data that you need. And then I think it's very important as well to have a look and understand that employee experience is not something that sits separate from the job. So often people look at it and they, they see employee experience and the data points around that is something completely separate. Your function, your functional um, aspects of your employee experience are the foundation. So make the personalization begin there and then provide a front door to everything else that they need. So look at each employee and work out what do they need to be able to do their job to the best of their ability, provide one place that they can go and that they can see all the different things that they need to have access to. This is a really great way just to get started and make sure that you have started to look at personalization where it, it really matters. Um, you know, from a talk perspective, we always look at the four pillars to a great employee experience. And we say that it speaks about conversation, being able to have communication to and from the business, your recognition and reward piece, which is not necessarily um, monetary, but it could be access to pieces of learning. It can be access to uh, di different content pieces, your community function, how does everybody interact with each other and how do you grow the culture of the business? And then of course, as I've just spoken about, your functional element is very, very key. How do you help your employee to be able to do their job to the best of their ability? And what tools do you need to be able to provide them based on the data points that you have to allow for a great, um, a great, employee experience there and for allowing, allowing them to be successful in their roles. So if we have a, a look at the next level of data-driven HR, and I'm not going to go too far into this because I'm cognizant of time, but having a look at where, where it's going in terms of trends. Um, chatbots 
are really becoming something that is, is inc um, increasingly powerful in the employee experience space, especially with a geographically diverse workforce. Chatbots based on the different data points and based on the fact that they can use APIs to go in and look at different, um, different data sets. Uh, chatbots can be used really effectively for assisting people to look at what is their leave balance, um, what is their onboarding, what are the work times, um, how can they access different benefit information. They can ask the question, the chatbot can fetch the information for them. And no matter which time zone then you're working in or uh, how spread out your team is, you're able to then service this geographically diverse workforce. So definitely something that is worth taking a look at. And then predictive analytics. So this I, I sort of touched on a little bit earlier when we were um, when we were having a look at uh, your data input points. But if you start to create really great um, and rich data sets on your employees, you can start to utilize predictive analytics to have a look at like when uh, when are you seeing trends of absenteeism. When are people, uh, and when are they going, when is there this high spike of absenteeism and why? Why is there a high spike of absenteeism over this space? Predictive analytics will then be able to allow you to staff up or um, staff back in terms of casual staff based on trends that you've seen in the past few years. It will then tell you when you need to be able to start that onboarding experience and when you need to start recruiting. So definitely a powerful piece and definitely something that is, that is on the horizon if you're not doing it already. And then as your capabilities uh, deepen in the data-driven space, um, you're going to be able to anticipate shifts in needs, motivations, and drivers. So I know we, we talk a lot about COVID at the moment, but you know, we are now seeing this massive, massive shift this year, obviously, where people are looking for content and support around um, mental wellness. We're looking at uh, the, you know, access to benefits that they didn't previously use. Um, being able to use predictive analytics and data-driven HR, you're going to be able to see what is the shift in need. Um, what do people need? What is motivating them? And what are the drivers that are, are that are going to be able um, to allow you to put into your business as a benefit or uh, make part of your EVP that will make you an employer of choice. I mean, things that we see on the horizon at the moment is this, um, is the, the bubble up effect where people are doing a lot of reverse mentoring with different generations. Uh, you know, if you can start to anticipate that shift, you would be able to already position that as part of your EVP and uh, be able to start attracting top talent who are seeing you then as an employer of choice. So that's really it from my side. And I think we're going to um, hand back over to the panel and um, back over to Sangula. Yes. Um... Thank you very much, Sadi. I appreciate it. That was a very comprehensive presentation and uh, very interesting indeed. We're going to be moving over to the kind of the panel discussion section of the question where we're just going to be unpacking some of the elements of what you discussed. And I'd like to discuss with Farrah Lynn, um, who I'm asking, you know, in your, in your experience at MassMart, how do you use data to inform your approach to benefits? Um, as well as your onboarding process. Secondly, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges uh, facing corporates when it comes to the use of data? Great, hi, hi everybody. Um, so I think that if we're um, taking a, business, a, a data first approach allows businesses to make informed decisions because you're not making decisions based on a hunch or an instinct. Um, it also allows businesses to be proactive because you can use the, the data to provide insights into things like demographics or an employee preferences um, so that you can then provide benefits that are valuable to the employee, but also benefits that the employee wants. Um, being able to spot trends can also assist businesses to be ahead of the curve instead of just being reactive. Um, and I think that a data-led approach can also lead to both tangible and intangible cost savings um, to businesses. And then, of course, as Sally touched on, enhancing the employee value proposition, which is key um, in retaining talent. Um, MassMart's approach to using um, 
data and specifically with with um, in relation to onboarding, the pandemic really seems to have changed the world forever. And certainly for the time being, gone are the days where a new employee would come into the office on their first day for induction, they get a tour around the office, they'd meet and get to know their colleagues face to face. Um, and so in, in this new world, you businesses need to remember that you don't get to make the first make a first impression twice. And in the absence of face-to-face -face contact, you still want an onboarding experience that sets the tone and culture of the organization, but also makes the employee feel welcome and feel part of the organization. Um, so data can help a business provide a bespoke onboarding experience where the recruit only sees the information that's relevant to their role or their department. For example, you could um, use information such as gender and job, job grade to provide new recruits with information on affinity groups that they might like to join. Um, and then, of course, there's also a compliance advantage for um, the businesses because you can also build systems that require um, certain training modules are completed or tests um, so that you can make sure that uh, the new recruits engage with the content, but content, but also understand the content. Um, and then, of course, you can, with systems, um, you can leverage technology um, and provide a gamification element, for example, where um, the new recruit, after they've finished their um, onboarding experience, can get a little voucher to uh, get a free coffee from the canteen or something like that. And that also provides that instantaneous um, reward. I'm taking a look at challenges um, for corporates so, and data. In our experience with in a very large organization that has multiple points of um, data, data capturing points, data integrity has been a, a big challenge for us as people often capture and pay attention to the correctness of important fields, important fields such as name and gender, but the less important fields such as first language, for example, aren't always as reliably captured on the system. So, I mean, the quality of your data depends on the quality of the information that's been inputted in, into the system. Once you have that starting point, the, um, depending on the complexity and the size of your business, the segmentation of, of the data can be also a bit of a challenge. For example, um, if there is more than one job title for a particular role and you want to target some communication to that um, people in that particular role, identifying the correct audience can be a bit of a challenge. Um, I think probably in my experience, the biggest challenge that we've had is around the maintenance of the data. Um, people change all the time, their circumstances change, etc. And employees are not great at updating their personal information. So something like banking details, people will update because if they don't do that, then they're not going to get paid. But things like marital, marital status, um, people don't really or oh, aren't as diligent in advising HR to update that information. Um, taking a look at a South African context, um, so our employees often have more than one phone number or they change their phone number often, you know, to get the latest deal. Um, and so you might have the per A number on the system, but whether that number, whether the message is going to actually get to the employee is a different story. Of course, we all know that access to technology and data also remains an uh, 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 issue in South Africa. Um, but conversely, also, we find we've got a defunct postal service and often employees don't have a, pop a proper address with a postal code. So when you might not be able to use technology for, let's say, data constraints, but by the same token, it's then difficult to communicate with um, in hard copy because you don't know if that, inf if that information is actually going to reach the employee using um, the postal service. Um, so I think there, there are a few challenges, they're not insurmountable challenges, um, and I, the big lesson for us has been that data management is an iterative process, you do have to start somewhere and it does seem like a lot of slog and grind, 
Um, it needs constant refinement and constant attention. But um, as Sally pointed out, the benefits for an organization just persevering and you know you can start small with the basic information and expand as you go on will really really benefit um companies and businesses thanks all right thank you very much Farrelyn. and gareth over to you Farrelyn mentioned that uh, you know there's a lot of different data touch points throughout the organization that everybody is really in control of different aspects of uh, employee information. Um, what are the benefits of having all that in one place, um, uh, having all an employee uh, data in one key database um, that maybe is controlled by a handful of people? Great, thanks. Thanks, Angula, and hello to everybody in the audience, of course. Uh, I think before I answer that, as, as the data guy, I just want to touch on the topic of data quickly. Uh, Farrelyn did a um, sort of outline some, some great challenges, et cetera, that they're experiencing. Uh, but just on the topic of data, I think we all acknowledge um, and understand the hype of it and the power of it. Uh, but at the same time, I think data's had a pretty bad rap over the years. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that share my sentiment that, you know, we've had instances of struggling to get access to it, uh, the quality of it. Um, and generally it's led to, to a lot of stress and a lot of frustration. Uh, but before you start throwing tomatoes at me, the good news is that I think there have been so many advancements in, in this field over the years, especially of late. Um, and I mean, there, there are great tools available, there are data management platforms popping up on a regular basis. Uh, and you'll also find um, that there's an expectation on most platforms to have an API nowadays. If, if you don't know what that is, it's called an application programming interface, and it really allows you to be able to access data from these third party systems in close to real time. So that's the good news. And I think looking at that good news, I think we all need to change our, our frame of mind and, and, and sort of shake off this bad rap of data uh, and really understand that if we can get this right, uh, and of course, as Farrell Lynn said, it's a process, but if we get it right, the real exciting thing about data is what we can do with it and the doors that it opens. So just getting back to your question quickly about the, the benefits of a central data repository or data lake or database, um, the a great way to frame it for, for the audience is to, to, to simplify it is to think of art, A-R-T, um, the ability to act, the ability to react, and the ability to target. So Sally mentioned early on, obviously, uh, marketing counterparts. Now, when you chat with your marketing counterparts in the marketing department, they'll tell you that the holy grail of marketing is something called a, a single customer view. Now, in our context, we're after the same thing, but we're after a, 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 an, a, um, an employer, a single employee view. And the benefits of this, of course, with, with everything in a central place, is you have the ability to act and to move forward with your employee experience objectives and priorities. The uh, added benefit, of course, is, is you now also have a stream of data coming into this repository from different places. So you have line of sight of, levers, arrivers, uh, engagements, uh, failures, successes, and you're able to react to that and build automated processes and escalations to react to that in close to real time as well. The last one, of course, is the segmentation, which has been touched on in this, in this presentation, is, is getting that right really allows us to identify and to start targeting with precision people in specific roles, locations, brands, uh, etc. So, now, in summary, think of it as art, but I think the big thing for me and, and important to mention here, Sangula, is, you know, we're living in interesting times. We're living in a new economy that requires us as organizations to be uh, adaptive, uh, to streamline, to restructure, uh, and of course, to look for efficiencies. And having a central database um, and a central repository and the single employee view, not just allows us to adapt and to streamline as a business, but to communicate this effectively to our employees so that they can adapt with us. Uh, and I think that's, that's vital. Okay, and I mean, can you take us through what this means practically? For instance, how does one go about collating and cleaning data that they have in the organization? Okay, so, so yeah, I wanna, I wanna try, and, try and skip the technical jargon and, and not bore anyone here, but you know, Farrellyn once again said some 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 great things early on around some of the challenges. So I think just to put it into very simple terms is 
I'm sure you've got a friend called Max in the IT department or uh, Jeff possibly, but I think there needs to be a close link with your technical department around capabilities and the technical components that are required. Um, and I think, um, you know, some basics there is, is the, the right data warehouse for the purpose, uh, horses for courses there. Uh, you know, your technical department needs to choose what's right for them. The other thing, of course, is, is the right connections, making sure that data is being fed into this warehouse successfully. So, you know, I mentioned earlier on <clears throat> that most, most platforms nowadays should really have an API. Uh, you know, traditionally, where we were doing this manually and importing and exporting and cleaning up quickly, uh, I mean, those days really should be gone and we should be looking at getting these data feeds in real time. So looking at the connection method there is important, but as Farrellyn said earlier on, I think it's also important as an organization to look at the challenges we have with that data and understand those. And of course, Farrellyn has developed that over time. Um, she's looked and said, cool, well, you know, um, there's a big problem with uh, known as names versus birth names. There's a big problem with marital status. There's a problem with you know, the contactability, are they using their personal email addresses uh, or business email addresses? So I think we need to understand that, but we also need to treat that as the exception uh, and work through those exceptions very carefully. And that generally should translate into adopting certain internal policies and practices and, and ways in terms of um, uh, working through those and not letting that being a stumbling block to moving forward, but just at least preparing a journey moving forward where you're gonna start working around those and, and addressing, as I said, problems at source or ways in which we can address that internally within our central database. Um, am I still on here? All right, and what kind of analytics and insights can be pulled from all this? Yeah, I think that's, that's really one of the outputs here, isn't it? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm the data guy, I'm not the, the BI guy, but we obviously, BI being business intelligence, we obviously work very closely with these guys because, you know, ultimately having this data in a central place, having it clean, having it segmented, I mean, it's like, it's absolute rocket fuel for, uh, for your reports. So the way to look at it is, is, you know, it's great to pull reports from one source and you can do some really great things with that. But what we're doing with a central repository is that we're overlapping this data, right? We're overlapping performance data, um, uh, recruitment data, uh, payroll data, uh, and it really allows us to report now across different touch points. Uh, it gives us massive flexibility uh, in terms of uh, uh, an enrichment in terms of the analytics. Um, so if you wanted to, for example, overlay performance or sales data, you, know, you can start seeing uh, which regions, for example, are performing. Uh, you could even measure so engagement uh, within EX and how this translates to you know, better leads, better performance, better sales, uh, and really even get to a point where you could uh, measure how this leads to a better net promoter score. Uh, I see, thanks, Sangula, you've whipped up a, a poll question here. And I think you know, ultimately these reports and, and analytics are gonna be a product of how well you, you execute points, questions one and two. And I think the simple question here is, are you able to pull a report on your most productive and engagement employees, engaged employees, apologies? And the answer to that is really gonna tell us how well you're, you're, you're sort of executing question one and question two. And yeah, from the, from the results, uh, it seems that the majority of people uh, are not able to kind of get that information at the click of a button, which yeah. is uh, essentially what we're here to discuss. And there's, there's, there's the 22% who, who do have that capability and kudos to all of you for really being ahead of the curve in that regard. Yes, um, absolutely. If I can comment there quickly, Sangula, what, what cool. that shows me really is, is, as I said, in order for you to be able to, you know, pull a report on your most productive and engaged employees means that you're getting all of those steps right. So any chink in that, in that process, or any break in that process is gonna to lead to you not being able to pull a report of this nature. So uh, it's difficult to, when I say it's difficult to get to this point, there are steps that you need to follow to get to this point, but that 22%, uh, I mean, massive kudos to, to you guys. All right, well, uh, well, we have a couple of minutes left and it's time for Q and A. We do have a couple of questions. If you do have any other questions, please do uh, put them in the chat. I'm going to start with the first question, which has been addressed to yourself, Sally, from Malile um, Ramasamole. And she says, um, hi, Sally, thanks for the great info. How do we handle perceptions of unfairness 
with all the personalization? Um, no, I actually know really. Hi. Um, what do you mean uh, with regards to perception of unfairness? Can you just elaborate for me a little bit? Um, I, 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 from you know, if I had to just um, you know, kind of figure out what she's trying to say is that if you put, if uh, one personalized experience seems to maybe um, there's some element of favoritism um, aligned to to an individual, I, I, I suppose they get better training or maybe a different kind of uh, benefits based on the personalization that other people don't um, don't want or don't receive. Do you, do you, I, I think that's what you meant. Can you clarify my little bit if possible? But is there any opportunity for there to be some kind of favoritism when you do this kind of personalization? Well, I think the idea is, is really is just, you know, um, uh, it's just really, you know, if you're using your data points and you're looking at your different communication strategy, um, because it is personalized, it sh there shouldn't be any element of unfairness because you should be serving the same opportunities based on what the person needs to the, you know, to the right person. Um, in the same way that, you know, uh, if people like cats, for them getting a, getting a cat video is not unfair on Facebook, they're seeing what they want. Um, in the same way that ideally, the, the person that then likes dogs should see dogs. So you you're you're you should be using the same data points to inform that um, that content, that benefit, that reward. So there shouldn't be an element of unfairness. It should be targeted um, so that everybody is getting exactly what they want or what they need based on the data points that you've used. If you're finding a skewed approach because there's a lot of data missing in a specific data point and that then some people are getting something because there's data missing, then in order to, uh, to address that, I would then say potentially don't look at that data point or run a specific campaign to enrich that data point so that you are able to um, produce a more fair and beneficial employee experience around that. I hope that answered that, but otherwise, please pop me a mail and I'll... <laughs> I okay. think, I think um, we've got an example here from Chanel Smeda. She says, how do you manage the unfairness of the cost to company of one employer to another differs in the monetary cost? Uh, so, is that possible at all? I mean, if you're using, you know, this uh, unique employee experience, experience to help choose your benefits for your employees, and uh, they, they cost the company, uh, it ends up being more for one employee than the other. Is that something that can possibly happen? I mean, you know, it would be, but again, it would, I guess it would be sitting side by side and comparing what they're able to see. Um, ideally, the way that this should be done and it should be executed is that an employee has no idea that what they're seeing is different to what somebody else sees. They're both being given their opportunity to potentially look at a specific benefit or make a specific decision that is available to that role but it's not being done it's being done in an automated fashion that they're seeing what's relevant to them at the correct time so it's about serving the right data piece to the right person at the right time and everybody should be having that same experience so unless they're sitting side by side and comparing um, exactly what they're seeing as they're looking at their potentially their employee engagement portal they shouldn't be able to see that um, it should be completely personalized and completely unique. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, I, think I hope to just add on to that. Obviously, within your system, there are parameters. So if, you know, your cost, cost to company is X amount, that's not going to change in the system. The system will have those parameters and won't give the world of options to um, the user. Okay. And then I think uh, this, we have another question for I think it's Gareth from Chanel Smeda says they would like to consider the migration from paper to electronic but it's quite difficult and challenging in a manufacturing environment where most of the uh, employees are blue collar workers um, how do, do you have any advice for Chanel um, Gareth on how to get started on this um, migration from paper to electronic uh, absolutely and I mean that's such an exciting exciting project and one that would certainly get us very excited I think as a starting point, it will be important to 
really map out what are these touch points and what are the, uh, uh, the, the touch points with the employees and what data we're referring to here. You know, the reality is, is that everybody's got a smartphone nowadays and they're really great technology uh, uh, applications and, and opportunities out there in terms of engaging. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I can't comment with specifics, but I think once you have that map of these touch points and understand where the paper trail is at the moment and start identifying uh, in the order of priority, which of those you can start addressing and start moving over to a digital process would be the starting point. And it is a process, but ultimately you've got to look over time and you've got to identify uh, how you want to roll that out. Uh, and, and slowly you'll get to a point where the one foot is in the old way, uh, the next foot is in the new way, but you're starting to move in the right direction. All right. And um, I mean, we still have a couple of minutes here left. And I, I suppose uh, the question I would have uh, for the panel while we wait for some more questions. Um, wait, wait, here's a question from Gloria. When it comes to benefits, is the differentiator not on the structuring of the value rather than the total rand amount? Would you like to take that, Fer? Um, yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with what Gloria and Gloria's comment, at least. All right, and I mean, for me, the question that I have, uh, Sally, you can advise, excuse me, is, where does one start with this journey? Because uh, like you said, there are so many different data points. And when you want to like start the migration to creating employee experiences, it can seem daunting um, because uh, you know, what, what area do you even begin? Uh, what's the easiest way to start the process to get to a point where you can have a whole employee experience um, kind of um, charted in a way that you can create a unique experience? So for me, the, the first thing that I would do is have a look and, and run a little bit of an audit and see what is the base level, most complete data set that we have. So what is, what is, like, what is our, our core data that we look at and what can we do with that data? So even if, we own, even if we know, let's say at an absolute base level, we know the person's um, we know their their name, their known their their birth name, their known as name, uh, which brand they work for, for example, and the location. Already based just on those data points, you can start to create something that's that's more unique to them. You can start to personalize and address them by the name that the the, their, the name that they have indicated preference on. You can start to target communication that's only based to that location. Um, so that they can see things that are only relevant to them and then things that are pertinent to their brand. From there, the next from there I would add the next layer on and I'd start to say, okay, great. Now let's look at um, now let's look at the learning and development side or the content piece. What content can we provide this person that's going to add value to them? And that can be based on their benefit structures that can be based on the data that they've told you about themselves. And you can start to add value to the employee's lives straight away um, based on those data points. So what if, if they've got a family, um, you can send them information that's around uh, families and communications and health for your family. That's that, that experience would look different to somebody that perhaps is um, is is not doesn't have children, um, but has a different kind of blended family setup. So they, that you would have two different employee experiences based just on those data points. From there, we start to look at the rewards and recognition pieces and the input and feedback that's actually coming from the employee. What are they telling you? What do they want? Um, and that's that conversational piece that I was talking about. And then you can start to enrich from there. So I think like with everything, it says like, well, let's, let's start really, really small. Let's understand that as Farallon said, this is an iterative process. Let's just start small and just start by having two or three points that are slightly different and that we're actually tailor making to those data points. Because let's not forget as well, um, in terms of communication, in terms of uh, sending out a lot of stuff, the, the comms teams and the HR teams 
can often be limited in terms of capacity to create different content pieces for all of the different personas. So that is something that also needs to be taken into consideration is what is the, you know, what is the size of the team that can deliver on this. So yes, definitely let's start with what's viable right now and just start to do those little pieces. And from there you can build and enrich exactly the same way that you do for your customers. Just taking that exact same process and turning it, turning it towards your employee, you can use the same structures and start to build it out from there. Okay. Um, I think uh, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I think it was a very insightful conversation about how to really create unique employee experiences at scale. Um, I'd just like to tell you before we knock off to the next one, our next uh, webinar is going to be um, on 9th of June. And uh, we're gonna begin some new research from Workday about how to find out what your employees really need. And uh, thereafter, on the 10th of June, we are going to be talking about um, the vaccine rollout and everything we know about, need to know about it. We're going to be talking to experts from international SOS who are going to tell us what's happening on the African continent and abroad and how that should impact your health and wellness strategy. So thank you all. And um, yes, have a very good day further. I hope ESCOM is good to you for the rest of the day and the week. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, thank you everyone. very much. All right.